After George Washington's mysterious death, the British revealed their true feelings It was George Washington's last day. The great man had fallen ill just 24 hours earlier on December 13, 1799, with what at first appeared to be nothing more than a cold and a sore throat. But a bevy of doctors struggled to halt the increasing severity of his symptoms, which now included breathing difficulties. Death came with unexpected speed, and Washington was gone at the age of 67. What was truly surprising, though, was the reaction of his old enemy, the British. Washington's decline had started on December 12th when he toured his estate, Mount Vernon, in driving sleet. Soaked to his skin, he then went back to his mansion where guests awaited him. Ever the attentive host, instead of changing out of his cold and sodden garments, he sat down to dinner with his visitors. Two days later, however, Washington was dead and a nation grieved. But it wasn't just Americans who noticed the passing of this man who would played such a major part in forging their nation. The British also had cause to register the fact that Washington, who had led an army against them in the Revolutionary War, had died. And the British reaction to Washington's death came in the context of the fact that the man could be regarded as a traitor to the British Empire. After all, he had been an officer in the colonial British militia that fought against the French. But by 1769, he had had enough of British taxation without representation and turned against his colonial masters. The Revolutionary War between Britain and the Thirteen Colonies was a bitter conflict that dragged on for eight years before the British finally conceded defeat. Tens of thousands of British troops had lost their lives in the conflict. So on the face of it, the British had little reason to love the first U.S. President. But their reaction to his death continues to astonish even today. We will get back to that surprising British reaction to Washington's demise shortly. But first, let's take a quick refresher on the man's story. George Washington was born in Westmoreland County, Virginia, at a place called Pope's Creek in 1732. John Washington, his great-grandfather, was the first of his ancestors to arrive in America. John had come to Virginia from England in 1656. Washington's father, Augustine, was a judge. Like all of those born in the British colonies in America at the time, Washington was a subject of the monarch of the day, King George II. During Washington's childhood, the family relocated on a couple of occasions but always stayed within Virginia. In 1743, Augustine passed away, meaning that Washington was left with a farm and ten slaves. Although Washington didn't attend school as a youngster, he was taught the basics of math and also showed some talent in drawing. These skills later earned him work as a surveyor in 1748. The College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia awarded him his surveyor's license a year later. Washington worked in that profession until 1750, and by 1752 he was a substantial landowner with holdings of more than 2,300 acres in Virginia. In 1752, Washington took a commission as a major in the Virginia militia. At the time, there was a conflict between the British and the French as they vied for dominance in the Ohio Valley with both sides dotting the region with forts. Virginia's lieutenant governor then gave Washington a special mission in 1753. He was to make peace with some of the Native American tribes and give the French their marching orders from territory claimed by the British. In the event, however, the French refused to budge. And in 1752, Washington had his first taste of battle when his militia detachment successfully ambushed a French unit. This sparked further conflict in what would come to be known as the French and Indian War. Washington was promoted to regimental commander, but in a pitched battle with the French at Fort Necessity, his force was defeated and compelled to surrender. Washington subsequently gave up his commission, but continued to act as an aide-de-camp to General Edward Braddock on a voluntary basis. But Washington experienced the bitter taste of defeat again in 1755 when the French attacked Braddock's forces killing the general and routing his force at the Battle of Monongahela. Despite the defeat and an acute bout of dysentery, Washington emerged with honor, having roused the remaining part of the British forces and enabling the survivors to retreat. During the fighting, bullets whizzed through his clothing and twice horses he was riding were wounded. Washington's well-earned reputation for bravery in the face of danger would stay with him the rest of his life. In 1759, now aged 26, Washington wed Martha Custis, 
Although the two never had children together, there were two from Martha's previous marriage. Her first husband had died in 1757, leaving her a large inheritance. Forsaking his military career for now, Washington and his wife settled at his Mount Vernon estate in Virginia. As well as overseeing the plantation, Washington now also turned his hand to politics. By this time, in fact, with the money and land Martha had brought to the marriage, Washington now ranked among Virginia's richest residents. In 1758, he became an elected representative on the Virginia General Assembly, a position he held for seven years. During this period, however, his frustration with the British colonial administration grew. In 1769, Washington was one of the leading lights in a campaign to boycott British goods. The British Parliament and the monarch in London precipitated this action with measures designed to tighten control of the American colonies. Predictably, mounting tension between the colonials and their British masters came to a head in 1775 with the start of the American Revolutionary War. The Americans were divided into two factions. There were those who supported armed insurrection against the British, who were termed the Patriots. Then there were others who believed that they owed their loyalty to the King. People in this group were known as the Loyalists. Washington is said to have been unpleasantly shocked by the outbreak of hostilities. He immediately left his Mount Vernon plantation to join the Continental Congress, the body formed by the Patriots. Shocked though he may have been, Washington had no doubt about which side he was on, and his loyalty to the Patriots and the Continental Congress was soon confirmed when he was appointed Commander-in-Chief of the American Rebels' Continental Army. Its first major engagement came in the summer of 1775 with the Siege of Boston. Washington arrived at Boston in July and his mission was to defeat the British forces ensconced in the city. When Washington reached Boston, he made Cambridge his base and found that his army was an ill-disciplined ragtag band. He set about imposing strict discipline with regular drilling and introduced flogging for miscreants. Eventually, in March of 1776, Washington's force succeeded in dislodging the British from Boston, who fled by sea. This was the first notable victory for the rebels. But there would be no quick victory in this war for independence from the British. In fact, the conflict was to drag on for another eight years. Notable events during the war included the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Despite this act of defiance, though, Washington's troops were subsequently forced into retreat after the Battle of Long Island. The Long Island defeat and resulting retreat marked a low point in Patriot fortunes and a nadir for Washington himself. Even some of his own troops and supporters were turning against him. Then, however, came a victory that revitalized the rebels' cause. In military terms, the crossing of the Delaware River and the defeat of the British at Trenton, New Jersey was a fairly minor affair, but it inspired the Patriots. The final major action of the war came in 1781. This was at Yorktown, Virginia, where the armies of the French and the Patriot troops laid siege to a British force in the city. The battle resulted in the capture of some 7,000 British troops. It was the last important engagement of the conflict and the end of the road for British dominance in America. Peace talks resulted in the signing of the Treaty of Paris in September 1783. This landmark agreement secured the independence of the United States guaranteeing its status as a free and independent country. For Washington, it was time to step down from his military duties and return to his Mount Vernon estate. Addressing Congress on the occasion of his resignation, Washington said, I consider it an indispensable duty to close this last solemn act of my official life by commending the interests of our dearest country to the protection of Almighty God and those who have the superintendence of them to his holy keeping. Despite those earnest words, of course, the truth was that this was far from the last solemn act of Washington's public life. Nonetheless, for the moment at least, he did return to the tranquility of Mount Vernon, where he'd spent only ten days during the eight years he'd commanded the Continental Army. Although his finances were far from thriving, it was a blessed relief to return to his plantation. But the call of public life returned in 1787, when reluctantly and after much persuasion, Washington attended the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. This was held against a background of disorder in the U.S. and calls for a new constitution to stabilize the young nation. Washington attended the convention as part of the Virginia delegation, having refused an invitation to lead it. 
Once Washington appeared at the convention, however, the delegates wasted little time in nominating him as the body's president general. Two years later, the convention went on to elect Washington as the first president of the U.S. In spite of serious misgivings about once again departing Mount Vernon for public life, Washington traveled to New York in April 1789 for his inauguration. The ceremony was held in New York City's Federal Hall, and a crowd of some 10,000 was entertained by a marching band and a 13-gun salute. Washington declined a salary, but Congress insisted that he accept $25,000 a year for the inevitable expenses of the presidency. So, having led the country to freedom as military commander-in-chief, Washington now stood at the head of a youthful nation as president. In his acceptance speech, Washington implored God to consecrate the liberties and happiness of the people of the United States. The new president's view was that he would serve one four-year term only. But the perilous state of the nation convinced him to agree on a second term. Moreover, despite the political discord that surrounded him, he built a reputation as a nonpartisan leader. Washington's patience must have been sorely tried by the bitter rivalry between two leading figures in his administration, Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. The latter was a Federalist, while Jefferson emphasized states' rights, reflecting tensions that trouble the U.S. to this day. In fact, it can be argued that their constant feuding over policy was a key factor in Washington's decision to agree to a second term. However, Washington needed a lot of persuasion to take that second term of office. Ironically, arch enemies Hamilton and Jefferson were both among those who succeeded in convincing Washington to agree to another four-year term. It was one of the few things the bitter rivals agreed on. In March 1793, the Electoral College unanimously elected Washington as president for the second time. Washington was finally able to relinquish the presidency in 1797, and it seems that this event came not a moment too soon as far as he was concerned. The American press and his political enemies had been increasingly hostile towards him as his presidency drew to a close, something he bitterly resented. Washington also believed that the nation would be best served by a genuine contest for the presidency. At last, Washington was able to return to his beloved Mount Vernon and Martha, but it still wasn't quite the end of his public life. Hostilities with revolutionary France had broken out in 1798, and Washington now reprised his role as commander-in-chief of the U.S. military. It seems his position was largely symbolic, though, with Alexander Hamilton actually taking the day-to-day -day command. In the event, the conflict was limited, with no fighting on American soil. Sadly, though, Washington had little time to enjoy his life after retiring from the presidency. As we saw earlier, it was less than three years later, in December 1799, that Washington fell ill and died at his Mount Vernon estate. The onset of his illness was shockingly sudden after he'd taken a soaking in freezing weather while touring the Mount Vernon acres. The doctors bled Washington, extracting several pints of blood, but this treatment did nothing to ease the badly swollen throat that troubled him. Modern medical science has diagnosed a likely case of epiglottis, a swelling to the rear of the tongue that can severely restrict breathing. The loss of so much blood may have been a factor in Washington's death at the age of 67. It's hardly a surprise that Washington's death was widely mourned in the U.S., a nation that he'd done so much to create. But what does come as more of a surprise is the reaction of his old enemy, the British. Instead of celebrating the death of a man who could be regarded as a traitor to Britain, there was instead an outpouring of genuine grief. In 1999, History Today magazine quoted from an article published in London's The Morning Chronicle at the time of Washington's death. The whole range of history does not present to our view a character upon which we can dwell with such entire and unmixed admiration, the paper's contributor wrote. And there were other highly complimentary eulogies in British newspapers. In a 1986 piece, the United Press International News Agency quoted extracts from some other British newspaper articles. One piece from March of 1800 asserted that, "...the whole range of history does not present to our view a character upon which we can dwell with such entire and unmixed admiration. The long life of George Washington is not stained by a single blot." His fame, bounded by no country, will be confined by no age. Another British newspaper article, also published in March of 1800, proclaimed rather wordily that his coolness in danger, his firmness in distress, his moderation in the hour of victory, his resignation of power, and his meritorious deportment in private life 
have established a name which will go down in history with those who have deserved well of their country, those who are entitled to be considered the benefactors of mankind. Reading these fulsome British tributes to George Washington, it's almost a struggle to remember that this was the man who led a revolutionary war against Britain that dragged on for more than eight years. Even the Royal Navy got in on the act, lowering their flags to half-mast to mark Washington's death. In fact, poor old Washington, although an American hero today, received a lot more abuse from his own people than he did from the British while he was alive. That was especially so during his second presidential term. Somehow though, at least by the time of his death, he would become a deeply respected and even revered figure in the country that he would turned against in 1775. And of course, today many Americans regard him as the father of his country.